speak to about some of the area around the, the Isle of Wight. No problems, take off, flew it for well over an hour and was pretty impressed with it. Now when I came back to a carriage for a landing, they called me from the safety boat on the water saying, uh, we have had a wind change, so we've got to change the landing lane and uh, we'll have to sweep the landing lane to see if there's no debris on it. And that'll take us a quarter of an hour. And I said, sorry, I haven't got the fuel used so much. They said, right, bit of a qu quick confair and uh, we'll have to take the chance. Uh, so I landed, touched down, was running along at about 100 miles an hour on the surface of water, beautifully running, and suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw ahead of me down there um, a black object. It was, as it turned out, a full-length mast from a yacht which had been dismasted. And masts, like icebergs, are mainly two-thirds of the surface is under the water. There was nothing I could do anyway, on a hundred mile an hour run. And um, it hit the foreplane of the aircraft, the underbody of it, knocked a hole four feet square in that, and then under the pressure of the body, shot out like a bullet and knocked the starboard float off the aircraft. The sequence of events she just could not cater for. And um, I held the wing up as long as I could, but eventually I had to drop. And when it did, we just cartwheeled. And um, rushing along at about 85 miles an hour, which I had the cockpit hood open, but um, there's a lot of water getting in at the time. And um, when we came to a, a grinding halt, I thought, fine, I'll just drop out of this and swim away. But my parachute, for some reason I know not, was jammed. And um, so I had to unhook my parachute, leave it in the cockpit, and get out. And by this time, I'd been swallowing a lot of water. And when I got out, um, every time I thought I'd popped the surface, I found I was under the wing. And eventually, I just lost consciousness. And the chief test pilot of saunders called Jeffrey Tyson, very well-known test pilot, was in his nice suit and everything. He didn't hesitate, he leapt out of the launch, grabbed me and hauled me to the launch. So I was very lucky. To this day, we've sought for that boat. The search is, believe it or not, is still going on. I get reports from it and they just cannot find a damn thing. There are huge tidal races around this area, and um, at the moment they haven't found a thing. Wow. So did you buy your friend a new suit? Sorry? Did you buy your friend a new suit? Oh, not quite, not quite. <laughs> I bought him a few beers, sir. I'll put it to you this way. Um, I think you were tense all the time in that sort of work. In combat, you're not tense all the time. Um, the reason we were doing this was um, we realized after the end of war, we were going to have to get... Uh, every country was going to go into the civil aviation field. 
and they were going to, if they were jet operated, they'd be flying at high altitude. Even if, uh, you know, 30, 40,000 feet. And uh, Thunderheads, that's where they hang around, particularly in the Far East, of course. But um, so therefore we had to find out what the actual structural stresses were. You had a, a feeling there was just nothing you could do about it. You were tossed around like a rubber ball. The one thing I was told to do, and which was the best advice you could have in these circumstances, is clap on your eyes onto the artificial horizon. Just keep the airplane as near as possible level. Don't worry about how much it goes up or down or over in this way now. Just try and keep it back into a, a laterally level position. And eventually you will be spewed out of the, the cloud and hopefully in a, a reasonable position and state. But there are so many things going on, like um, St. Elmer's fire, lightning strikes, and the acrid smell you get of um, when you are struck by lightning. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. And um, there's some pretty big bangs go on when I'm there. And, uh, I would put it down to one of the most unpleasant flying experiences I've ever had. Yep. The Spitfire was specially chosen because, of course, it's got a, a brake factor of 10G. Uh, Civil Airlines aren't going to stand anything like that. So uh, we were f this aircraft was fully instrumented and we uh, got records of a bunch of G's we were talking about. And uh, six, seven were pretty normal. You know, uh, passengers aren't going to enjoy that. I mean, the airline is uh, way below that. So, it was uh, absolutely essential work. But I'll put it this way to you, very demanding. You are tired physically because you're doing this all the time, uh, trying to keep level. Uh, but I think you are mentally exhausted by all the fireworks going on around you all the time. I mean, the prop has an Elmer's fire, a circle of it, all the time, and uh, it's quite distressing because one of the things is you're trying to, you're in pitch blackness, you're trying to fly on instruments, and um, you choose the light in the cabin very carefully, and then suddenly you get this huge glow ahead of you, and that can be quite dangerous to destroy your night vision. That type of thing. It's a, it's a hairy ex experience. You're landing on a skid, and you cannot afford to land on runways for that. You've got to land on grass. And um, it's a little unstable on one skid. So Farnborough, we had a, we had some captured German scientists who wanted to devise a transonic fighter for research. And they, in their design, they had twin skids, but which retracted beautifully into the cockpit into the um, fuselage. So, 
The landing speed of the aircraft was estimated at 160 miles an hour. Now the landing speed on the 163 is I would say about 100 to 110. You're coming in at 125 and you ease off a minute and it plonks down. So there was a gap there. <clears throat> And they wanted me just to push up the landing speed and um, see if it uh, would hold tight. <coughs> so we chose uh, a large grass landing field at uh, Wittering, RAF Wittering and um, moved, started off at about 130 miles an hour, moving up to 158 when the skid collapsed at 158 and uh, two things happened when it collapsed the aircraft toppled over on the left wing started veering off to the left and the skid the main skid came straight up through the cockpit caught my legs and uh, took them up I was very fortunate if it had just gone on with them I think I'd have lost my legs, but I was jammed solid up against the underside of the, of the instrument panel. Couldn't move. There was no fire. We didn't have any fuel aboard. Um, but it took about an hour and a half to cut me out. And, uh, and um, I had a very black spine at the time, blue spine. Apart from that, no damage done, to me anyway. Now, we, at the end of the war, we invited British aircraft manufacturers come and see some of the booty that we had captured. And de Havilland in particular were fascinated by the 163. But I may say the aviation world was fascinated by the 163, mainly because of its huge number of innovatory features. De Havilland saw this, said, right, We'll go one better. Instead of 23 degrees of sweep back, we'll have 45. And instead of a rocket engine, we'll go for a jet, reusable aircraft. So that's it was at the beginning. And it was built very rapidly after the war. Did its first flight in 1946. Chief Test Pilot Jeffrey de Havilland. And the company felt it had the potential to break the world speed record, which at that time stood at 616 miles an hour by the meteor. Um, <clears throat> so Jeffrey was told in those days, too, you had to do a the runs for the world speed record at 1,100 feet, a metric reason. So he was told to start at 7, 000, uh, 10,000 feet, sorry. Full power run, right if all was well, come down at 1,000 feet at a time. And he was running at 7,000 feet. And... Uh, around about Mach 0.8, when without any warning the aircraft totally disintegrated. And the wreckage landed at a place called Egypt Bay in the, in the mouth of the Thames. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey's body landed nearby and he had his parachute on but it was unopened. We tested it immediately after, 
Nothing wrong with it. So that was a bit of a mystery. While we were puzzling over that, the docs were examining him, and they suddenly announced that his neck had been broken before he left the aircraft. So, the hunt was on, what would cause this? And uh, we know that what tailless aircraft, although this wasn't totally tailless, it had a vertical tail, um, we do get pronounced longitudinal instability. And uh, particularly in bumpy weather. Anyway, the whole world was very interested in what had caused it. So we consulted Lippisch, the German designer of the Delta Wing, and also the designer of the 163. Willie Messerschmitt didn't design the one. He built it, but he, he didn't design it. And Lippisch said, oh, they've got the CG too far aft. If you have a tailless aircraft, you must keep the CG well forward. So, armed with this information, decided to build a third DH-108. There was a slow speed one in between. Um, and we were going to strengthen the wings and, and these were the two main things. There were other little things we did to it, to strengthen the wings and fit an ejection seat. So, in the wisdom, the whole of aviation kept bothering Britain, what's the cause of this? And the pressure really was on. And eventually we decided, handed over to RE and said, uh, you conduct the action investigation. Now he said, there's only one way of doing this. We'll have to repeat exactly what Jeffrey did. <clears throat> We've got better strengthened wings, ejection seat. So I, I was head of aerodynamics flight at that time, so I obviously had to do the job. <clears throat> and um, I was repeating what Jeffrey did. Full powers run, starting at 10,000, coming down. And I was much lower than Jeffrey, I was down to 4,000 feet. And a higher speed too, <coughs> about 0.88. And um, suddenly, same thing happened, a violent runaway oscillation. And uh, it was so violent that it, subjected me to plus four, minus three G, three times every second. So that would explain why this other airplane said he could only see a blur. But the wings held. <clears throat> and um, this went on for seven seconds with full instrumentation aboard. <clears throat> and um, I realized that we couldn't get out of this, so the ejection seat, but under 4G, I couldn't get my hands up to pull the blind. Um, they were both stuck down here. So I had one on the throttle and one on the stick. And after seven seconds, I just pulled the two of them slowly back together. And as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. We don't think it was what I did. We think it was because we just ran into calm air. So I'm not claiming any magic there. Just we'd been in, we hadn't been in violently bumpy air, but slightly bumpy air. <coughs> and um, with all this data, of course, um, we had, a restriction was put on there. The air, air, aircraft. <coughs> but my successor at Farnborough 
when I left there, uh, carried on the work, and uh, he knew the restrictions, but it was felt that he possibly had decided to have a little bit of a go anyway. And uh, same thing happened, fatal accident. <coughs> there were three built, all three had fatal accidents. The other, the other one, um, when we did the wind tunnel test, we found this aeroplane had extremely bad spinning characteristics. Uh, and um, in the thing there, you'll find I was asked to do a stall using a thing called a trailing static, which is a long rubber lead with a thing like a bomb, a little bomb on the end of it. This gives a true airspeed reading, all clear of the fuss and whatnot around the airplane. And um, the wind tunnel thing showed that it snapped into a vicious left wing um, stall. And um, if it wasn't counteracted immediately, it would go into an inverted spin. So I was told to try and keep the wing up for as long as possible with the opposite airline, but be ready for the worst. Uh, I couldn't stop it. When it went, it really went. We turned over an inverted spin, and this huge 100 feet of rubber tube wrapped itself round the rudder. So we couldn't get out of that, um, shall we say, to, initially we couldn't get out of it. But desperation drives you to, and I've pushed a colossal foot load on it. It's on record somewhere, but stretched the summer tube enough to make the rather uh, effective. Got out of it, so all was well. So it was a really nasty little airplane. And as I say, the third pilot, one of mine again, was killed, again doing a spin. But the airplane, the slow speed version, had at each wingtip, it had a, a parachute. <clears throat> so if you got in a spin, you popped the two wingtip parachutes, which jerked you out of the spin. He got into a spin, popped the parachute, only one opened. I always think there were two things helped me. Firstly, I was meticulous about preparation. I, when I joined Fabra, the accident rate amongst test pilots was Utterly, utterly appalling. It was over 25%. And I saw the attitude was pilots were posted from fighter squadrons to be test pilots. We had no test pilot school at that early stage. And the attitude was kick the tires, light the fires, and the last one off the city. It really was like that. And they were going up there, being confronted with things which um, they ought to have known a lot more about. Uh, that is the result of indifference of talking to the boffins. I, I was a sort of academic test pilot, to be honest with you. And um, I loved talking with the boffins. I, I was one of them rather than one of the, uh, the pilots. And um, they, you learn such a lot. I wondered, why aren't these guys interested? It's their lives. They've got families to look after. I mean, if you're going to be a good test pilot, you mustn't get a health and safety attitude about it. You've got to understand it's a risky game, but you assess the risks. And um, 
when you assess those risks, you do everything you can to put them within your control. And uh, if you do that, you will last a long time. I think the other thing that contributed to my uh, survival was my stature. Um, twice I can think of occasions when I could have lost my legs. We talked about one of them in the 163. And one number of crashes I then I was able to tuck my legs under the seat. Also, you see guys today, six feet two, they can barely get in the cockpit. When they eject, their knees get cut off by the canopy. So stature and, if you like, preparation are the two things I would say.